Thank you everyone for joining us today. We have the privilege of talking to some of the leading educators who are professionalizing OSINT training at the institution level. We'll be discussing basically the evolution of open source intelligence opportunities in education. So we need some experts versus myself on that subject. Joining us today for the discussion is Dr. Stephen Colthart. Uh, Dr. Stephen Colthart, Associate Professor in the College of Emergency Preparedness, Homeland Security, and Cybersecurity, and Director of the Open Source Intelligence Lab at the University at Albany. Thanks for joining us, Stephen. Thank you. We also have Brian Fuller. Brian is the Professor of OSINT and Managed Attribution for the Ridge Intelligence Program at Mercyhurst University. Welcome to the program, Brian. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Jason James. Jason is the Assistant Professor of Cybersecurity at Indiana State University and Director of the High Tech Crime Unit. Jason, welcome to the program. Thank you. We really do thank everyone for joining us today at OSIN UP. Um, I've talked to all of you during the, the Needle Stack podcast series, so I'm, I'm familiar with your institutions and what's started to happen at, you know in our at the university level but for our guest today um let's have each of you kind of tell us a little bit about your osin programs uh, and we'll, we'll go from there maybe um we start with you steve sure uh thank you jeff um so the open source intelligence program at the university at albany um is really a, a very much a new program uh, we launched in um uh, april of 2023, so we're just getting started. Um, and essentially what we're trying to do is create an academic home for open source intelligence um, in academia that is very broadly um, uh, positioned. So um, we're definitely focusing on Homeland Security, but also as well thinking about cybersecurity. Um, and as a part of that, um, we'll be, um, uh, we are offering a uh, fundamentals of OSINT course uh, through the university. Um, that students that will work in the lab, that will um, serve external clients eventually, um, will get all their training from to prepare them to do that work. That's super interesting. Um, Brian, tell us a little bit about what you have going on at Mercyhurst. So uh, what we're teaching in the academic curriculum at the uh, foundational level is as our freshman intro courses, we're teaching how to do proper open source intelligence research and collection uh, and utilizing managed attribution capabilities to reduce all technical and topical risk in order to safely collect the information, uh, whether you're doing it for a strategic, tactical, or uh, competitive business intelligence uh, practices. We're not just focusing on the government side, we're working on the uh, private sector as well. And the way we're really getting students not only a great education in the classroom, but we're also utilizing our Center for Intelligence Research and Analysis Training, or CRAT, to, uh, to get the applied experience that the students need and not just learning it in the classroom, but actually applying it in real world, uh, uh, in a real world environment with real world uh, clients from uh, decision makers within the private sector, government, or uh, non government organizations, uh, NGOs, non government organizations. And uh, we're also moving towards doing a, uh, a professionalized online training course where we're going to try to do certificates and more uh, instead of a full degree program, certifying professionals that are out there that may want to continue their professional careers uh, or professionalizing themselves in the OSINT discipline. Thanks very much for that, Brian. Jason, tell us a little bit about what's going on uh, at Indiana State University. Sure, thank you. So at Indiana State University, um, you know, our program uh, integrates uh, OSINT into all the courses uh, and programs that we uh, teach. Um, you know, we run a high tech crime unit um, where our investigators do digital forensics for local law enforcement. Um, these students are sworn in investigators. Um, and we recently uh, launched a new human trafficking intel unit that specifically uses OSINT to, you know, help track down, you know, human traffickers, sex uh, victims, 
uh, you know, using OSINT that they've learned uh, in their courses. So, you know, we, like I said, we, we utilize OSINT in a lot of our, our courses. So it's becoming uh, more and more um, focused in our program. That's great. Kit. Let's double back a little bit on what y'all just said there. Cause for example, Jason, you were just talking about, so OSINT's going across multiple disciplines. Um, you know, maybe as compared to getting an OSINT certific certification and maybe there's not such a thing as an OSINT degree today. Um, so uh, let's go back to you, Stephen. Can you tell me, tell me a little bit about, you know, what does this mean for kids coming out? What kind of degrees are they getting? Um, what kind of jobs are they going into that are, you know, around the, the OSINT field? Oh, wow, that's really tough. I mean, I think it depends on um, the variety of basically what the student's interest is. I mean, mm -hmm. you have plenty of students that will do work, say, um, uh, interested, they're interested, say, in national security. So they they might pursue more of an international relations degree, um, you know, either as a standalone um, or as a part of a political science degree. You may have folks that are interested more on the law enforcement side, um, you know, speaking to what Jason was just talking about, folks that are you know, focusing on, you know, counter human trafficking, they might be coming from more of that kind of um, uh, criminal justice side, or they could be doing information science as well. Um, I think that often when it comes to OSINT, one of the difficult things is trying to figure out where you fit into the community. Uh, one of the things I do with my students right at the beginning of, that, at the, of uh, the intro OSINT course is, where do you fit in? Um, because depending on what direction you want to go in, you have a wide variety of different possibilities. I mean, um, and that's really going to, there are certain, I think, um, uh, core skills that we can talk about. Um, mm -hmm. I try to get at those in the class, but really depending on the direction that you're going in, that's going to drive um, the specific tools you might be thinking about, um, uh, what languages you might need to speak, uh, and what technical uh, skills you might need. Um, so certainly, you know, the difference is, say, between someone doing um, um, OSINT for cybersecurity work is going to differ than, say, doing, you know, right. uh, uh, counter human trafficking. No, that, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, Brian, what about coming out on, on from from your side at Mercyhurst? Is it or what kind of degrees are they sure. typically coming up with? Is it is it getting certified? How does it look in your world? So we actually have an undergraduate degree in intelligence studies. Uh, you can take one to two tracks, strategic intelligence or competitive uh, intelligence, uh, depending on the degree that uh, you come out with will depend on where you're using it. Now, everything we teach, everything that we do, one of the core functions of it is open source intelligence. All of the other disciplines that are out there, depending on where you end up, um, you may have other disciplines that you learn later on, but the, one of the core foundations for us is either is OSINT, human, and uh, it, and adding in counter intel. With the OSINT, uh, a lot of where our students are ending up, they end up in our strategic with our strategic degree. They're ending up in the Beltway somewhere or in one of the agencies, uh, law enforcement, uh, a lot of federal law enforcement. With our competitive intel degree a lot of them are ending up in the private sector in uh, fortune 500 companies um, they're ending up in uh, you know big pharma they could be ending up in oil they could be ending up in some type of you know amazon dell you name it they could also be ending up on as steven talked about one of the big things we're seeing right now is uh cyber threat analysts and so having an OSINT background and being able to identify cyber threat actors and what they're doing, especially on the dark web um, and identifying those threats and providing them to the cybersecurity professionals, we're helping with the network defense. Instead of being reactive to it, we're trying to be proactive to it. And quite honestly, that's a big open source intelligence uh, uh, field sure. right now. For sure. So yeah, and um, then our math program those students are ending up at the higher levels okay and jason what about at indiana state i know you have a focus on cybersecurity. then you have this you know you're involved as the director of the high tech crime unit what are they typically studying as their primary major with you're the one that started at osin it's across all the disciplines yeah so uh, our program uh here is unique uh, when it comes to cyber security is uh, our program falls in the School of Criminology and Security Studies, so our students are learning uh, 
is learning not only you know cybersecurity such as security risks, but a big focus is digital forensics, um, as well as uh, as well as criminology and behavioral analysis. And within the and within that program, you know they're learning uh, OSINT and how to do investigations. But you know a lot of our a lot of our students, our program prepares students for a variety of jobs. A lot of our students are going uh, into law enforcement. Some are going into um, the, the secret uh, security agencies. Um, mm -hmm. Some of these have gone, you know, to public uh, as well as private uh, corporations. So they're not just getting a specific expertise, but they're getting uh, expertise across, uh, you know, different uh, avenues. And, you know, what all of you are saying with that, with the, you know, going across whether it's different degrees and depending or applying it, if you decided to focus on national security, like Stephen, like you were saying, um, you know, we just seen OSIN apply in, in, in so many different places, um, you know, even reporters now and on the news side, um, you know, there's sections of OSIN enthusiasts, so it uh, makes a lot of sense that it goes um, so horizontal. Um, you know, but I will say, at least from my experience, um, you know, initially everyone that you came across, and obviously the phrase OSINT or the acronym OSINT, again, for everyone OSINT is for open source intelligence, you know, came, th those individuals had military backgrounds. Um, it sounds like each of your organizations, though, um, are, are leveraging real world examples for the students um, to help drive this instruction. In fact, I think some of your organizations, it's not just instruction, right? It, it's it's true engagements, um, both with private and, and public sector. Maybe we talk a little bit about what that looks like. Um, Brian, I'll start with you. Can you talk a little bit about the types of projects and where they come from uh, that the students leverage in, in the program? Absolutely. So inside our Center for Intelligence Research and Analysis Training, we we have separated a program from the curriculum. So you get in the classroom, you're getting the foundational training uh, on how to do everything with OSINT. But then inside the, the uh, center, the CRAT, we have determined that it's not just enough to get the education, you need to get the applied experience in actually practicing uh, the trade craft. So when we started the center, we decided uh, it would be set up to provide services to real world clients, whether they're in the government or in uh, private sector business. And these are actually contractual obligated projects. So it's almost like we're operating like a vendor without being a vendor. Um, the op what it is, is we're bringing in opportunities for these students to get these projects that are going to affect decision makers in these different industries and in these different agencies. And we're using OSINT as the primary function of that. Mm -hmm. And what's crazy is, I mean, what's great is, if you think about it, all of these agencies and all of these companies have all of these great secret, top secret, uh, you know, disciplines and capabilities, but the one basic one at the most foundational level, OSINT, they're not very good at, right? Mm -hmm. So that's because it's kind of counterintuitive for them to understand that, what the big data environment's really like and how to get through that. But just as with their top secret systems, with their secret systems, with their protected networks, they are, uh, they have a lot of security and a lot of network defense in that. And they know how to protect it with trying to be able to get on an unclassified network and go into these environments where a lot of great information is or adversaries are operating it's it's hard for them sometimes to do it safely and mitigate all technical and topical risk. Mm -hmm. So inside the center, this is where we have the opportunity to get them to provide us those issues or those risks that, that they're facing, those collection requirements they may need for a decision maker and mm -hmm. turn it over to us, the professionals, to do the proper OSINT uh, uh, tech research and collection and trade craft. So they're coming in and giving our students these great applied experiences. And it's going out to real world clients, right? Real world decision makers, C-suite personnel, directors of agencies. That's awesome. Jason, can you tell me a little bit about, um, you know, what kind of projects are they working on uh, within your program and, with, and where do they come from? Sir, 
uh, one of the, you know one of the things our program focuses specifically on are uh, investigative internships. So you know our program cyber program started back in 2018, and over the past two to three years, we've developed uh, four investigative internships within uh, our Center for Cyber Criminology and uh, Digital Forensics. Uh, the first one, which I mentioned earlier, is our cream of the crop, our high tech crime unit. So these are students that are working real world uh, digital forensics for, you know, we serve eight counties, 25 law enforcement agencies. So they're actually getting real world experience and they're being paid. So this is done, you know, through a grant offered uh, through the state of Indiana. And because of the success of that, we started a, you know, cold case unit. So these individuals are, you know, utilizing OSINT for, you know, information for, you know, cases that may be 15, 20 years old, but need relative uh, intel on individuals that are still um, at large. And then we also launched a jail intel, um, though not OSINT based, it's really students listening to jail calls for intel uh, internally, but we, we, did, we have launched our fourth investigative internships that are they're working with uh, real world uh, detectives and cases. These students, like I said, are doing human trafficking uh, and sex trafficking mm -hmm. intel to help track down um, not only locally, but internationally. For instance, we worked with Operation Underground Railroad um, and helped them uh, do OSINT to try to find uh, information about you know, sex traffickers, uh, child molesters, that sort of thing. So all sure. of our program, all of our programs are getting um, unique experience and, you know, work, getting that ex experimental learning um, within our program. Gotcha. No, that's awesome. And you guys are, you, all of you were talking about, you know, we talked about something we've seen a great deal of, which is, and I mentioned a lot of the OSINT experts we come across have come from the military and some sort of government background, but that it's so much even happening in the private sector, sector um, whether it's for corporate fraud and counterfeits related to products or we talk a lot about how it's now applied in the in the cybersecurity world. Um, I think one thing our you know the people that will be joining us for OSINT up today, um, they're probably a little um, outside of the college years. Uh, what they may be interested in though, as they are looking at you know this whole new generation of of, of students that have you know have been able to go to school and and lever and, and get formal training in in OSINT, you know. How do they stack up uh, in terms of, you know, what you can learn in school? So let me ask actually um, more specifically, you know, as digital natives, do we think they're more adept at, at, at doing OSINT or, or are they more vulnerable because they're um, so used to everything being online? And um, I'll start, I'll come back to you, Jason. You know, what are your thoughts on this, the, this current generation of students that are actually being trained? How, what do you think about their skill sets? So I think their skill sets, you know, these students, you know, most of these students are that we're we have are in the range of eighteen to twenty-two. So they're in the generation of you know of cellular of data. You know, they were born not long before uh, the age of the iPhone. So these students already have that you know knowledge and expertise in their head. And those things can be as simple as going on to Google and searching someone's name and finding them on Facebook or Snapchat, you know, that's OSINT in its, its basics form. And that's what our students uh, are doing. You know, it may not be the, the real in-depth uh, OSINT, but, you know, on a high level, they're searching for individuals. Um, and there's once they find individuals, they're searching, you know, certain things to find out, you know, where they, where do they live? What do they do? Um, but I think, students in this day and age have a have a leg up because they all they have ever really known is technology and it shows when they're you know being taught uh OSIN. sure that makes a lot of sense steven what what are some of your thoughts on this about this this crop of yeah students yeah so i mean my my sense has been that um kind of building on what what jason was just saying that on one hand i think the students are more comfortable um uh, le leveraging open source information. So in that way, they kind of have an advantage over say, like, uh, um, I'd be, I guess I'd be considered a geriatric millennial. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, too, uh, I feel like as an instructor, one of the things that I have to think a lot about is that 
um, their level of comfort sometimes is a dual edge. Uh, uh, it, it cuts both ways. It can be a dual edge mm -hmm. sword. I, so if, one way to kind of think about this is that I've explained to people is that, you know, if you were in the generation um, around the time that the automobile was being developed, you'd be far more familiar with how the car actually works as opposed mm -hmm. to, you know, if you were born in the 50s and 60s. Um, because you would have to be able to uh, get under the hood, so to speak, um, if you were in that earlier generation. Whereas I think now um, a lot of kind of like user interface um, is so much more intuitive than it was 20 years ago, 25 years ago. So one of the things that I teach in my class is initially, you know, to do things like how to use um, like how to use Linux. You know, a lot of students come in and they have no idea how to use a command line. Um, mm -hmm. It's not something that they necessarily would know how to do. And I think that's in part because there's been something of kind of a uh, um, an Appleification, you know, uh, to refer to Apple uh, sure. of user interfaces where things are so much simpler um, that people haven't, you know, learned how to get under the hood and do things that are a little bit harder. Um, so I, I see both the strength the students have, but I think that also increases the importance of formal education, of having someone sit there and help you through those things. And if Apple wants to be a sponsor of Osin Up, well, we, we'll go ahead and take that, by the way, just if they're listening. <laughs> um, Brian, I want to ask you a question, you know, uh, and we can jump around here. On OSINT, a lot of people have different frameworks, whether you're applying OSINT, well, and when we open up cybersecurity, cybersecurity folks have all kinds of different processes they follow um, uh, or frameworks that they follow as, as well as as well as tools. Is are there, you know, how do you go about that in ter as far as training or, or exposing these uh, kids to it in school today? Do you expose them to every type of framework that's out there or way to conduct research or even if it's on cybersecurity to NIST or whatever it is? Like, how do you go about that side, the tools and framework side of, of OSINT with students? So that's that's driven by the work we do in the CRAT. So okay. um, what, what really is great is right now we currently have 92 different tools and platforms we put in these uh, these students' toolboxes. But those change based on a couple of different things. One, it it's based on the relevance of that tool um, at the time. So constantly changing is our social media landscape. So are the tools that have to change with it to be able to mm -hmm. keep up with it to properly collect the OSINT. Manage attribution, authenticate, is great at keeping up with their managed attribution capabilities and understanding how the the big data environment is changing as well because just as our to the technology changes the tools have to change because the way in which uh publicly available information commercially available information uh or criminal information as i call it every everybody changes with that and if you don't keep up with it and have the right technologies and tools then you kind of become outpaced and it becomes irrelevant. So what I do is we, I, I vet every tool that we have and we use. I have grad assistants that I have specifically for vetting those tools and making sure that they're still relevant and that they're still uh, uh, keeping, you know, being updated and have the most current type of coding as we were talking about earlier to be able to properly collect. Uh, we've been mm -hmm. moving into the generative AI, you know, with generative mm -hmm. AI, we've really been moving in trying to keep up with that. And then at, just as well is there's always the ever changing vendor environment. So mm -hmm. what is the next best tool? And I want to keep up with that. So I have grad assistants that are constantly looking into the newest tools coming out and then looking at them from an OSINT perspective. Is this something that we should be teaching? The yeah, same with sure. our clients. Oh, go ahead, Jeff. No, I said no. They're changing all the time, right? So, um, as a vendor, right. I know I totally get that. So, yeah, and then what our you know what our clients' needs are. So right. we're unique in the CRAT that we see both what the government needs and wants, and what the private sector needs and wants in the way of their decision makers and what they're trying to collect. We're able to also look for tools that can operate in both areas and give us uh, the ability to be an all source, not just a, you know, we want to be a generalist when it comes to doing those research and collection, not necessarily a specialist. What, let me, that makes sense. Um, Jason, what about like on the framework side? Like I picture um, sitting in class, do I, you know, 
one chapter is about a certain way to collect or uh, in, in this type of way and, and, and I might do it or if I'm in cybersecurity, like how does it work in for today in, in educating these students to all the different frameworks and tools that are out there with with uh, at Indian State? Yeah, good question. So one thing uh, we focus on is, you know, OSINT framework. Um, you know, there's, you know, a website, you know, out there that gives you all the tools, but also one great resource we use in our class, you know, when we're teaching is Michael, Michael Bazell, um, his, uh, his book on uh, OSINT uh, techniques is phenomenal. He gives you all the tools and examples on, you know, how you can apply OSINT uh, to uh, everyday things. So uh, these are the types of things from an academic standpoint uh, that we're teaching uh, students in class, uh, utilizing uh, the best resources out there. That's great. Um, I want to take this final question and um, I want to direct it to you, Stephen. Um, others can chime in if, if, if Stephen doesn't cover, but I, I'm curious you know, how do you look at, you know, I was just asking about tools and frameworks, but what are, what are some of the, the most important lessons that you're trying to import, you know, impart on students um, that are moving into this career path, whether it's private or public sector, um, from an OSINT perspective, what are some of those key lessons that you want them to walk out of there with? The general structure of what I try to teach students when it comes to, to OSIN, and then I'll try to pull out a couple specific things. But yeah. what I try to do with my students is in the first part of, of, of our OSIN class is, you know, basically try to do the uh, for them to learn the basics um, so that they're doing ethical work um, and so that they're doing work that is um, uh, secure. Um, you know, they're not they're not engaging in illegal activity. Um, because I think there's a certain kind of um, uh, risk in teaching students some of these some of these techniques and skills. Um, you want to make sure that everybody understands that what they're doing is ethical and and um, uh, legally bound. Um, the second thing that I try to to teach them is to act as an effective collector. Um, so given the foundation that I just mentioned, you know, can they go out? in a variety of different platforms and, and use different tools to be able to um, effectively go out and collect information. Um, and then lastly, I try to teach them that when it comes to um, the first two items, you know, basically doing, doing the work so that you don't get yourself in trouble or do something that compromises mm -hmm. you. And secondly, to do good work um, uh, in, in terms of collecting information is to then remember that as an, as an analyst, their job uh, is to ultimately serve a customer and that without serving the customer um, the work really doesn't necessarily it doesn't really have meaning um, so the final third of the class is what does it mean to actually serve uh, customers um, to um, provide information in a bottom line upfront format to do an outstanding job of bringing value to the decision making process in a way that um, uh, you know gives value to that OSIN in the, in the first place um, I do try to always remind students to uh, that um, there's a lot of hype around OSINT. Um, it's important to remember that at the end of the day, um, while it certainly has significant value, um, there, there's uh, way more value in, in fusing together multiple sources of information and from across collection disciplines. And I think there's a, I'll make a pitch for it again. When I was on Authenticate um, last time, I believe I talked about there's a, uh, a case study of Vox um, where they went, um, and it has nothing to do with OSIN at the surface level, but they were trying to figure out, uh, people were discussing on Reddit the, these um, uh, circles that were appearing in the desert in North Africa. And um, the reporter was doing everything he could to try to figure out for this report, what were those circles in Africa uh, on the ground that they could see with commercial imagery. And they talked to experts. They did a whole bunch of what we would think of as open source information exploitation. But ultimately, the only way to really ever know what the circles in the desert were was to get a guy, uh, and I think Tunisia, pay him to drive out in the desert and actually go look and see what the circles were. Um, and I always try to, you know, impart on the students the importance that um, while the tools are getting more powerful um, and OSIN is becoming more relevant, to always remember that it's just one piece of a bigger puzzle. That's great. Um, 
Brian, any thoughts from you on on sort of the you know what are the the imparting lessons that the schools are trying to and these programs are trying to give to the students as they go out into the real world? Yeah, absolutely. That was a great answer, Stephen. And I think uh, Jason and Stephen will agree. One of the things that we foundationally train is first and foremost, you have the responsibility to reduce risk. You have to reduce your technical risk, which is the exposure to your networks, the exposure to uh, your workstations and the, and the exposure even to the tools that you're using um, and being able to be compromised or identified in that way. The second thing is technical risk. You also, you know, and this is where a lot of people fail is you have a responsibility to protect your, your operation, your mission, the reason that you're really collecting. And so you, you're mitigating the technical side is one thing, but not being compromised or identified as a collector whether it's by in the government side, a foreign government or foreign intelligence service, if it's in the private sector side, corporate espionage uh, actors, or even just plain competitors that you may be collecting information on. Uh, and the way we really teach to do this is you got to have a really good collection plan. You've got to have a really good uh, a risk assessment. You've got to really do a good job in keeping track of mitigating, you know, putting in the right attribution features to mitigate any of that, the, the risk that comes with that. And, you know, it, it, and, and reviewing it as you go through it, you also have to review it. This just isn't a, oh, I'm going to put these measures in place and then never come back and review those. We use Authentic 8 to build, to help build a really good managed attribution plan. So to me, one of the big foundational things to add to what Steven's talking about is reducing risk, whether it's technical or topical, mm -hmm. and not being compromised as a collector. Uh, I think that's, um, again, all great lessons for these students to take, take away. I'm, I'm super excited. It's been amazing to hear um, from all three of you, all three of your universities and that programs uh, around OSIN are now um, are now out there. I think it's going to be super interesting to those attending OSIN up today that, again, as we talked about it, kind of learned it hands-on from in various ways, just as they've come up through the ranks over the years. And now that there's, um, you know, going to be managing, if you will, a whole generation of, of folks that have been, um, have been professionally trained, um, you know, from the get-go in school. So I think that's great. So I want to thank all three of you uh, for joining us today. Um, it's very much appreciated and uh, thank you to our audience and everyone that's joined OSIN up uh, and made it such a success today. Um, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.